guys, welcome. Uh, this is part four of Foundations mini series, which is a, a series of uh, video calls where we are going through some of the kind of core principles around uh, coaching basketball at the grassroots junior level. Um, this is the last one. Uh, we, we've already been through grassroots philosophy and kind of how you might find your way to uh, developing the kind of coach that you're going to be and the reason that you want to uh, coach your kids and the reason that you want your kids to come to you. Uh, we've been through player development from when they come through the door for that first time and through to being kind of on their way to to being an elite player. How do you take that player through that process uh, and what are the steps for that? Yesterday, we were talking about planning a lot and practice planning and how to do that for training. And we had some great conversation about skill development versus training, practice versus training and some, some really nice um, interaction with you guys. Today, we're gonna talk about uh, competition and the game. And uh, there's so much to go through, you know, it's, it, it's gonna, uh, uh, with every one of these calls, I think I say the same thing, right? There's so much material here. We're not going to be able to go really very deep into any of these things. I am putting together uh, video courses for all of this stuff. And we're going to go right down deep into the levels in these courses. They'll be coming out in the next few months um, where you can go you know, very deep into philosophy, into practice planning, into goal setting, into uh, coaching the game, into individual player development, um, and then lots of different things around uh basketball coaching for really for junior levels you know I, um that's that's where i'm placing my focus i think that's where a lot of you guys are um so yeah we're going to get into today i'm going to share my screen right now and uh we're going to take a look at our topic today which is coaching the game let me put this here all right so the first thing I want to talk about today is the value of competition. Uh, I think it's interesting to ask a question. What is the value of us competing and playing games against other teams? So when I ask myself this question, uh, this is what I come up with. This is the kind of um, the thinking that I have. Uh, first of all, it's a test. Uh, when we play a competition we, or we play a game against another team, we are testing uh, our preparation and our training. Have we been doing things which are going to help us compete against another team? Is the training that we're doing uh, working? And you will find this out in games. Yeah? If you, and there are many ways to do it, but once you compete against another team, everything becomes a little bit more difficult all the things that you were doing in your practices, uh, it, it, it's all a bit more challenging now because there is an unpredictable other. Um, and this is a real test uh, and a great way to find out if you are moving in the right direction with your coaching, if your players are improving and, um, and if they're not in any areas or if things aren't working, then you get the opportunity to realize this. Um, uh, so, uh, much in the way that we study for tests in academics, um, in basketball, we get the opportunity to test over and over again, which really allows us to course correct and change the way we're coaching or, or planning or doing any of the individual skill development if we, if we need to. Um, secondly, it's a place for us to play. And play is a word which has a, a quite a lot of meanings and quite a lot of Maybe not quite a lot of meanings, but I think it has quite a lot of depth. You know, it's not just uh, it's not just playing in the sense that oh, we're just going to go out and have fun. Although it is that, right? Uh, we want. I always want, especially if I'm coaching kids, I want to make sure that they do enjoy the game, right? And I and I also, if I'm probably not going to coach professional basketball anymore. Um, I never say never, but I don't think I will. But even if I do, I still want uh, the players to enjoy themselves when they go out and play the game. Like that, 
I, I want that to be at, really at the heart of, of everything because the moment that we stop enjoying what we're doing is the moment I think we need to take a look and go, okay, why am I doing this? Um, and I, and, I, and I, I think that's a very important point. Um, but also play, you know, in terms of uh, getting after it, engaging in the competition, you know, really uh, experiencing um, the, the, the moment Okay, uh, and I'm going to talk about that in a, in, a, in a second when we talk about connection. But it gives us a chance to go out and, you know, I don't have to coach anymore. I don't have to blow the whistle or do any drills. We're going to go out and we're going to play. And that's a great, uh, that's a wonderful value of competition is that I don't have to really plan uh, any drills or activities for this game. Um, and uh, we're just going to get to see how it goes and uh, make adjustments on the fly. Um, the next thing we get to do is you get to learn. Um, competition is not, I don't, I don't like to separate competition from anything else that we're doing in basketball, you know, so I don't, I don't think that competition sits outside of basketball or outside of training. Uh, I think training basketball and the physical conditioning part that we're doing and the, uh, the, the mental and emotional aspect of it and then the competition is all a part of the game, right? When I call basketball the game, you know, that encompasses everything. And so every competition is an opportunity for uh, the coaches, the players, and the parents to learn. To learn what? To learn uh, about the skills and tactics uh, and the rules of the game, okay? Because if you're coaching under 14s, for example, um, like, like uh, a great example was on Saturday. I was, uh, I told you guys yesterday, I think I was refereeing and doing some coaching at this tournament. And, uh, you know, it's like under tens and these people don't know the rules, right? So the, the competition enables us to teach the rules to the children uh, during the game. You know, they have to, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's quite valuable because in the practice, you know, we might be focusing on helping the kids learn the fundamental skills like, good footwork and how to dribble the ball and how to work together but when you go to the competition you have to follow the rules and so it's a great way for kids to learn that oh, okay uh, that thing that coach was telling me about double dribble or not standing on the line or anything like that that actually has a real penalty now in the game we're actually going to lose the ball and uh, and competition is a great way for us to learn about the rules also there are many many teaching moments for uh, us as coaches during the game um, that you don't necessarily have to plan for, okay? Uh, so when, when we're planning our practices, we're thinking about, okay, what do I need to teach my kids? What do I need to teach my players to prepare them for that game? Um, but there are things that come up in the game which, which provide opportunities for you to teach. And a, a, a great example that comes to my mind happened many, many years ago when I was coaching in the UK. Uh, we went to, I took a bunch of kids away to uh, another European country to play in a tournament. And um, there's like four seconds left in the game. And we pass the ball into a, to one of our players and he, he grabs the ball, he dribbles once and he shoots the ball really quickly and misses, we lose the game. Another, uh, another kid on the team came over to that kid as the buzzer sounds and we're walking back to the bench and he's very sad, the kid. And another kid, Luke, came over to that person and, and, and all he said was, four, three, two, one, zero. And he was demonstrating the length of time that four seconds actually was because the kid that got the ball was like, he felt a lot of pressure and, he thought he had to get the shot off very quickly, did not realize that actually he had plenty of time to do something. So that was a, a really uh, beautiful learning moment for a kid. I was not involved in that in any way. You know, that was two other people, but I saw it um, happen. And so uh, I, I watched a beautiful teaching and learning moment, which came organically from the game. And I think that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, thing to, to be able to see. Uh, learning is also about learning about yourself. You know, when you play, uh, emotions come up. Uh, the, the situation can be like good or bad. You know, we can go on a run and uh, 
uh, you can start to feel very happy about, get, get really confident, start to play really well. Then all of a sudden things can go wrong, start to feel pressure, start to feel frustration. If we can help our kids to realize that um, the, co the competition, the game is actually providing us opportunities to learn a little bit more about ourselves. Like for example, you know, how do you guys feel or how did, how did you feel when there was 10 seconds left in the game and uh, we had a chance to win? Like, do you remember how you felt in that moment? And now how do you feel now? Right, this is, this is a, a, a very interesting practice to do with kids to see if they can connect with how they felt during pressure moments to see if they can learn a little bit more about themselves and those moments and, and perform better in them. Uh, so many, many learning uh, uh, opportunities in the game. And I think finally, um, and most importantly, the game offers us a, an opportunity to connect. Um, and what, what, what do I mean by connection? I mean that, uh, like with learning, you get to connect with the game. You get to connect with uh, the, the rules and the, the, your teammates and uh, the officials and the coaches and the parents. Like everybody is starting to build connections. We're starting to build relationships. Um, and I mean, you guys are all coaches. You've probably uh, been into different provinces. Maybe you've even been to different countries. The, the, the game allows us to connect with people in a way that we would never ever be able to do in a normal everyday situation. Uh, if you go work in a factory or if you go work in a, even in a school as a teacher or do a, just a regular job, you're not going to get to fly to Thailand and go and play in a basketball game and meet American guys and guys from Thailand and, and, and people from all over. Um, and so the game offers us such a wonderful opportunity to connect with ourselves and with the people around us. And, um, and I think appreciating that these values can help us when we approach the game as coaches, okay, for, for something that is a little bit of a thread through these four calls about winning and losing. Yeah, I've talked about this a few times now and placing a, a, you know, a, a very, very high value on winning and then everything else becoming sort of secondary. And I would like to address this and try to balance this out a little bit because there's so much value in competition that really isn't anything to do with winning or losing um, that I think it's really important to appreciate that. So now a question, a few questions for you about the value of winning and losing. And my question here is, what would you say after the game if this was your team? A few scenarios for you here. Your team plays badly. But one of your players, they do really well. They score 50 and they have the ball in their hands at the end of the game and they scrape you guys over the line. So you have a terrible game. Everybody plays poorly except for one person. And somehow that person drags you guys over the line and helps you to win the game. What are you going to say to your kids? Like, are you going to be very happy because you won the game? Or are there things, other things that we need to talk about, other things that we need to uh, dig into and maybe go back to practice with that is going to, going to fuel uh, some improvement for, for your group? Um, what about if your team plays well and they lose? Or if your team plays well and in the last two minutes, you just happen to miss a couple of shots and then you lose? Or how about if your team plays well, but for some reason, the ball just doesn't go in the basket. If you ever played the game, which I'm sure many of you have, you know this feeling. You're playing well, you're getting all the right shots, but for some reason, the ball just doesn't go in the basket. And as a player, you know, I was a shooter when I was younger and uh, I had big problems with this at different periods in my life um, where it would really rock my confidence um, because I, for some reason, the ball just wouldn't seem to go in the basket. Um, and Potentially, maybe my attachment to winning and be, you know, trying to help my team to win caused me a lot of angst and a lot of uh, difficulty, a lot of difficult emotions that I wasn't really able to deal with as a youngster because of this. So I would miss these shots and I would feel really guilty and I would feel really uh, frustrated and angry uh, and, and I didn't have any solutions. So I wonder if, you know, if I'm a coach 
and I, and uh, this some of my players experience this. How am I going to deal with this to help them flourish? Um, and then a, and a lot of the other two is your team wins by 50 or your team loses by 50. You know, uh, again, I'm sure you've been there. If you haven't been there, you just haven't coached long enough. Right, this is going to happen to you. Your team is going to lose by 50 or 60 or 70. It happens sometimes. The balance just isn't there in some games. Um, and it's very, very difficult to keep coaching during the game uh, and keep your head up. Um, but it is important that we maybe take the focus away from the score and the win or the loss for our kids to recognize some, some other value in playing this game. OK, um, so actually, I'm going to jump here to this. No. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to jump here to this um, and I'll come back to the other things in a minute. So those are some questions for you to think about. Now, before the basketball game, here are some considerations for you. OK, um, how much time are you going to spend on your team and your players before competition? OK, and so uh, the and, and I'll bring in the second one as well versus how much time are you going to spend scouting and preparing for the other team? Um, I'm going to talk about some offensive and defensive principles in a minute, which I consider to be uh, important for uh, high performance and doing well in competition. And now when I when I look at these principles, there's quite a lot of them and there's quite a lot of depth to each of them. So when I look at that and I say, right, we're, we're going to play a game on Saturday or we're going to play a game in two weeks time. How much of my time am I going to spend working with my players and my team on being really good at those things? As opposed to taking away some of that time and spend it on scouting the other team, which if we're talking about scouting the other team, what's the point of that? The point is to get an edge, I think. I think the point of scouting is to get some sort of edge over the other group. It's to find something with the other team that you can bring back to your group and, and say, okay, this is what these guys do quite a lot, or this is what they do in these situations, and we can do this to stop that or take advantage of certain situations. Um, Scouting can be very, very useful. It's very, very, uh, I love doing it. I really like the problem of solving the scouting problem, like looking at a basketball team and figuring out what they do on offense and what they do on defense and what their individual players do. Um, and then preparing that in such a way which I can present that to my team. And I have some scouting reports, which I'll share at the end. Um, and you guys can have those um, from seasons past. But when I reflect on some of my coaching years, I spent a lot of time on scouting. And I think I spent too much time uh, for a few different reasons. One, the, every minute that you spend scouting a team, it, you could spend that minute helping your kids and your team get better. And I think, and I, and I always, um, when I come back to my principles of connection and growth, uh, I, I want to focus that energy on the people that I work with, right? Um, there, there is value in this with scouting to some extent because you're helping your players overcome some problems. But, uh, you know, I've talked in, in these few series about creativity, about accessing the moment with the players and giving them the or helping them to have the ability to go out to the court and see what they see in front of them, recognize it, make decisions for themselves and live with the results and then we move from that point and i think that sometimes with scouting what we tend to do is try to give all the answers to the players here is the problem of this team here are the answers you just have to go and do it um, now as you move up the levels from junior to like elite junior and then you go towards professional and like national team okay scouting becomes much more important because the, the level of the players at, that, at those kind of levels is kind of similar, right? And if you can find an advantage from somewhere else, uh, you, 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 you get an advantage which you wouldn't ordinarily have. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, but as we come back to the junior levels, uh, for most of you, I would advise you, I suppose, to spend more of your time focusing on your team and what you do well and helping your players get better. And then if you are going to scout and if you are going to prepare for other teams, to make it very succinct. And that means like very to the point, you know, pick out one or two or three things which can you think can really influence the, the, the result of the game and can really help your kids to be successful. And those things you can come back to because if you get too complicated with it, now we start ending up focusing too much on, you know, this scouting stuff and the other team and all that kind of stuff. Um, another consideration is physical readiness. So that means uh, if the game is on the weekend, how do you prepare your group during the week in preparation for that game? And I'm making an assumption here that you have time, right? And that you're, let's say you're able to practice every day. Um, you might need in the two days before that game to kind of, take things down a notch you might need to not practice at the highest intensity you might need to cut the practice time a little bit so that your kids or your players can be physically uh, rested and ready for the competition because we all know that competition is different to practice and as much as we try to make practice like competition there is no there is nothing like competition and the kids the players they will extend themselves further than they will ever do in a practice just because competition brings that out in people. So if you were overloading our players during the week and we're making things very difficult for them, when it comes to the game, if they are not physically ready, if they are not prepared physically to compete, we are putting them at risk of injury. And that comes back to yesterday's practice planning point about safety. OK, so it is a consideration that mentally and physically our players are ready uh, to compete in the game. Now, sometimes you might want to load your players, you know, so that, uh, that they can they, they come to competition uh, somewhat fatigued. This might be something you're doing in preseason, for example, to build conditioning. But I would be very, very, very careful with that stuff for the reason I just said, you know, we, we don't want to put players in a situation where they might get injured. Finally, I would say that a consideration before any competition or any game is the focus that you are going to place on it. So in the scenarios that I gave you just now, um, one of uh, a couple of them at the end there were winning and losing by 50. So if you place your, uh, if we think about this kind of game, the result is not important anymore. You know, clearly one team is better than the other team. And if we are the losing team, we can, our players can be very frustrated. They can be sad. They can be angry. You know, they, they, could, they could have real negative energy around them because they cannot do what is expected of them. They cannot win the game. It is totally out of reach. And if our focus remains on the scoreboard and the winning of the game, we are, we are placing an unrealistic expectation on our kids which will further put them into, into a negative uh, way of thinking. We can shift the focus, right? You can shift the focus to uh, one quarter, or you can shift the focus to one particular aspect of the game, like rebounding or, or one shot on defense, for example, just allowing the other team to get one shot and not getting any offensive rebounds or making sure that you get a shot on offense. That might be successful for your team if you're in this you know, losing by 50 situation to work together to be able to get a shot off instead of turning the ball over uh, or something like that can be considered a win, right? And if you can turn your focus to things like that in those kind of situations, players and kids get very motivated very quickly if you are genuinely excited when they have success in these areas. And it works the other way. If you're the, the, the winning team, kids are going to get bored. They don't want to, they don't want, they, they, maybe they don't want to try anymore. They, they start not thinking about the game. And again, uh, you, we may get into a, a difficult area where kids might do something uh, which could put another kid at risk or put themselves at risk because they're not really focused. 
So in that moment, if we change the focus to, you know, making a certain number of passes or getting the ball into certain areas of the court or making sure that you don't get beat on, on defense or making sure that the ball never comes into the lane, for example. I don't know. So there's a lot of different examples that you can make. But um, you can see the point I'm trying to make. It, we can shift the focus for a game away from winning and losing. And, and we can do this even if we are trying to win the game. So maybe our focus in any particular game might be to screen really, really well. That might be the number one focus for tomorrow's game. Because in our practices and in our previous games, maybe this has not been going so well or it's something which you would like to teach to your kids. Um, and so placing a major, major focus on this and then reminding the players in huddles, timeouts, uh, maybe at halftime and keeping some kind of check on it so that you can hold players accountable, I think is very useful. And um, yeah, and that adds to the learning and, and, uh, and the, the, the test of the game. All right, uh, Calvin, do we have any questions at this point? Yes, coach. Uh, right now, uh, we have one from Coach Tata. Okay. He's asking, right. uh, how much time do we give to our role players during practices or in games? How much time do we give to our role players in practices or in games? Okay, so we're talking about the game today. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, it really depends. Uh, it depends on how old the kids are, what the level is, um, and, and sort of how important winning is for the group. You know, whether that's decided from above or we get to decide it with the parents and the kids. Um, but I would like to say that we give an appropriate amount of time to the role players. And this is not an easy question to answer because before we decide how much time we give to role players, we have to understand and we have to make sure that everybody in our group understands that everybody has a role. And when you say role players, it's a little bit, it has a little bit of a, uh, it's tainted a little bit with, it means when you say role player, everybody on this call knows what that means. It means somebody who's not playing that many minutes. But really, everybody on our team has a role. I'm the coach. That's my role. The starting point guard, that's their role. And there are certain responsibilities that come with that. Somebody that doesn't play very much, they also have a role. And if it's clearly defined and we are able to uh, help everybody on the team accept that they have a role to play, now that role can change if somebody decides that they want to change it, but they, they do need to accept that they have a role, okay? This is quite subtle, but it's very important and can, can really help you to, uh, for everybody on the team to kind of, be, kind of be happy being who they are. So I don't know if I've, I don't think I've mentioned this on, the, on, on this stuff, but I had a kid in Iceland called Danny who, who never really played for us, but was like our MVP. He was like our most important guy because in practice, he used to lead things which nobody else wanted to lead or nobody else could lead. He had a really loud voice. He loved to lead people. So he led the stretches. He, he led the warm-ups. Uh, he coached teams in practice. On the bench, he would get water for guys and he would get towels when they come out of the game. He would be giving encouragement. He would never play. He never played. He wasn't good enough. But he thoroughly enjoyed being a part of the team. And that was a person who had accepted their role on the team um and 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 don't, and don't get me wrong he wanted to play but he knew that people there were some other players that were a lot better than him and they would help us to win the game and the things that he did very well would help would help us to win the game so it's a balance that we have to strike you are trying to win the game there's no don't forget that all right we're always trying to win the game but we don't want to make winning at the expense of, of the values of competition that we talked about before, the test, the play, the learn, and the connect, all right? So I hope that answers the question. The coach is going to have to make his own decision on that uh, in terms of the amount of minutes you give to each player. But um, uh, I, would, I would just finish by saying the door is always open for me as a coach to any player that wants to talk about that 
uh, as long as we can be truthful and honest with each other, um, then, then, you know, there's going to be some times when we might disagree, but we have to make a decision as a group uh, as to how to, you know, work together. Coach, another question from Coach Louis, since we are talking about scouting, uh, what are like the top three that you consider most important in uh, the things that you should scout your opponents okay. or at least at the grassroots level? Yeah. Okay. At the grassroots level, I don't know if I, I wouldn't encourage scouting at the grassroots level. I don't think it's important. Um, but I will say that uh, when I am scouting, where are we here? Foundation. Give you one of these scouts. So here's a scout. Um, now, look, I don't know if I'm, I'm not the best scout in the world. So, you know, I'm going to give you what I, what I do. And um, here's where I would say the most important parts are. I always like to identify these things. These are the four, four factors, you know, that we, uh, we discussed previously. Um, there are four factors which statistically uh, determine success in games, and they are true shooting percentage, which includes free throw shooting percentage. So you put free throw shooting percentage inside of your team's overall shooting percentage, and you get a number. Uh, there are free throw attempts offensive rebounding and turnovers, okay? If you win all four of these in the game, you're likely to win the game, very, very likely. Uh, so we used to tally these and just show it, you know, how we, how we were doing. Um, then what I would do is uh, talk about like the, the major players, you know, what are their tendencies? What do they like to do? Because again, not again, but, you know, because the game is, the team is made up of the players. And as much as we might look at the tendencies of the team, which I will get to, um, it's, I think it's more valuable to look at the, the, the players themselves. You know, what do they like to do? Um, because that will give you a bit more information um, uh, and useful. Uh, there's a lot of words in this document. I don't particularly like it, uh, but it's, it's, it's quite thorough. So I'm saying... Uh, these four factors are important. I would put an individual one or two tendencies of the top three or four players. And then I would look at the offensive and defensive tendencies of the team. Okay. That, that, that's why you asked for three. I think I, I gave you four. That I would say four, four <laughs> things which I would consider to be what I would include on a scouting report. What do you Thanks, think about Gold. that, Louis? Hi, Coach. Uh, yeah, usually, Coach, uh, I think okay, for me, it's the key basic, especially with the grassroots. I think coaches should know it. It's like what kind of full court defense are they using? Okay, so since uh, here, uh, there's really up to the there's really no rule. Okay, it's like even if you're playing the grassroots coach, they really? play a lot of zone presses. Like, uh, really? Wow, it's terrible. Yeah, it's really, yeah. That's oh, why please don't do that. If you're on this call and you coach kids, don't do that. Don't yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah, taking Seriously. advantage. Yeah, because there's the coach, uh, actually here, coach, uh, even in grassroots under 12, they apply FIBA rules or, already. That's why if your team cannot cross the, court, the half court by eight seconds, okay, you're done. Wow. And they also use 24 seconds. Oh, in under 12s? Yes, coach. Yes. That's why most of the time, okay, since a lot of coaches are using zones, they only develop yeah. words. Because they're all there's they are always the ones that's in that that are included in the game. Because okay, they're yeah. the they're the front liners, they're the first liners. So they're wow. the only ones improving. The other three at the back, they're just yeah. staying and waiting. Well, okay. I mean, uh, yeah, like I say, guys, if you're on this call, um, we talked, I think, two days ago about playing the long game. And uh, it's a bit difficult, you know, if you're in an environment where all the coaches are doing a particular thing, like playing zone press in under 12s, and you're the person that's not doing it, it can be very difficult because you look... Especially odd. if you're losing games. And if you're losing games, yeah, yeah. that's true. And that, that's a very difficult thing to do. But... Um, but uh, 
you, you, you're going to have to, you know, you still have to look at yourself in the mirror each day. And th that's a decision that you're going to have to make each and every day is, are you going to lie to yourself or are you going to lie to everybody else? Not lie to everybody else, but, you know, go kind of go against everybody else. Um, so, yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. But I mean, if you're, you're either interested in the development of your kids or you're interested in winning games, I don't think that they're aligned if you're playing zone defense. Tough problem. Let's no, carry on. Thank you, Coach Rob. Great point. Great point. Uh, okay, I'm going to go through some offensive principles for you, which are, you know, I said principles are fundamental truths. I think these are fundamental to doing well in offense. And, and what I want to demonstrate here is that when we think about the game, uh, the result of the game, you know, 93-90, that doesn't tell you anything about any of these principles. I don't know how well the team spaced the floor, how well their timing was, or any of this stuff that's on this list uh, by, by knowing the score, right? So when you watch your team play in a competition, if you take your focus away from the score a little bit and you focus on any of these principles, you have material to practice, okay? So I'm just going to quickly go through the list because there's a couple in here you might not uh, quite understand. Spacing, uh, we, we talked about quite a lot uh, already. I mean, it's fundamental, especially when you're working with kids. Help them to understand that, that using space is very, very good, okay? And it's something that they are going to have to learn. When kids are young, they don't, in their brains, they don't understand the concept of space and they also don't understand the concept of personal space, okay? So you have to be quite creative when you help them to realize that, okay, we need to start moving away from the ball here. We need to start getting away. The further away you get, the more chance you're going to have to actually have the ball. Um, and yeah, that's a, it's something which can run through your drills and activities and games. Timing goes along with that. Um, I, I, as you get a little bit uh, better or a little bit older, timing becomes something which it's so good. It's so effective in offense at getting the ball to the basket. Like if you time cuts properly, if you time screens properly, if you time fakes properly, you will be able to move the defenders and create space. OK, and if you do it not properly, if you do it improperly, then things will look disjointed and you won't be able to have good rhythm in your offense. OK, uh, so I like to talk about this, uh, this, uh, this thing of getting on top. So we need to do something in our offense that gets us on top. All right. And that's that's uh, that's the initial goal of our offense is to make an advantage I think it was two days ago we talked about basketball is an advantage game now. So what can we do to make an advantage? You know, if you think about uh, like martial arts or wrestling or something, the, the, when you're fighting somebody, you, you're trying to get on top of them, right? To, to, to put the pressure on them, okay? So if you think about it in those terms, when we're playing offense, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put the defense at a disadvantage and then keep that disadvantage going. And we can do that in these ways by penetrating the lane. Get the basketball into the lane is a great way to get on top. Use basket cuts. Okay. Encourage your kids to cut to the basket. Yeah. That's a little bit of a lost art in today's game. Screen away from the ball. Okay. I, I, that's probably one of the other things, you know, along with zone defense that we can see in the junior game, which is not positive. There's too much screening on the ball. Uh, a great way to encourage kids to uh, space away is to, is to teach them how to screen somebody else who doesn't have the ball. If you can do that very well, you get two people open. Um, sorry, that should not be there. Move with the ball. Uh, move with a purpose. Move with a purpose. So a lot of the time kids, they move but they don't necessarily know where they are going or what they are doing. 
Um, and so we got to encourage them to understand spacing and timing and penetrating and basket cuts and how to do those things and setting screens. And then when they move, they go and do one of those things. Okay. So if you're going to move somewhere, what are you doing? You know, are you cutting to the basket? Are you screening for somebody? Are you just spacing the floor? That's okay too. You know, you don't have to always be sprinting at hundred miles an hour in the game, but you have to have a purpose. Okay. And then uh, communication is something which runs through everything that I do, right? We've got to communicate in all levels of offense, defense, and everything that we do. Defensive principles, transition effectively, okay? So move from finishing our offensive play back to defense quickly and effectively. And we have an anagram for this. It's called PAT. It's, anybody know what that means? Type it in the chat if you know what that means. What does PAT stand for? Anybody got it, Calvin? Give them five seconds. No one, coach. No one? Come on. <laughs> P-A-T. It means point and talk. Point and talk. When you're in transition defense, point and talk. Who are you pointing to? You're pointing to the ball. You're pointing to your man. Who are you, what are you talking about? You're talking about where is the ball? Who's going to protect the basket? Who's going to take the next threat? You know, this is a great thing to do. PAT, PAT, point and talk. Great stuff for transition defense. Okay, defend together. Two days ago, we said this, that defensively, we need to be as a unit. Okay, so when we're watching our team play, are they doing this together or is everybody sort of on their own, you know, doing their own thing? Move with the ball. So as the ball moves, from side to side or up and down, the players need to be moving in the similar way, okay? You guys know this from shell drill, right? If the ball passes, you've got to move on the flight of the ball as a defender. You cannot wait for the next person to receive the ball for you to start moving because then there's going to be too much space. And in offense, we want space. Defense, we don't want that. Pressure the ball, okay? You can't pressure the ball if you're playing zone, guys. We've got to pressure the ball with man-to-man -man defense. If you get pressure on the ball at all times when you are defending, what are you doing? You are, you are making the offensive players uncomfortable, okay? Point guards and guys that like to have the ball in their hands, they like nothing more than to have a little bit of space. If they have space, they can think. And they can look around and they can see, you know, what's around them. Okay, what shall I do next? Shall I pass it to that guy? Shall I beat my man? Shall I use this screen? But if, if the, ball, the ball handler has somebody in his face, putting their hand in, the, in their chest, you know, trying to disrupt what they're doing, it's very difficult to think. So pressure the ball. Uh, disrupt. Contest. Okay, so this means kind of the opposite to what we were talking about with offense. We were talking about in offense to get on top. Now on defense, I'm kind of talking about don't let these guys get on top. Don't let them go where they want to go. Uh, one of the things that we talk about is do not let anybody cut in front of your face. Okay, if there's somebody cuts in front of your face, that means they went in a straight line. Disrupt them, make them move them off the line. Okay, if somebody's going to go set a screen, don't let them just go to the screen. Let them go through you and you bump them, stuff like that. Contest shots and then box out, okay? Defensive principles there. So those are mine. Um, hopefully you've got your own or you can take these ones. Um, but the main point here is that when you're watching your game, when your kids are competing, yes, the score is important and I hope that you win the games. But when you're thinking about teaching your kids and coaching your kids, there are so many things which you can focus your effort on when you're coaching that the winning and the losing, that's going to take care of itself. If you get better, if your players get better in all of these principles, your team will be better and then you will start to win more. It doesn't work the other way around. All right. Uh, what, what do we have left here? I have just two more. Um, Calvin, is there any burning questions that we should take right now or can I carry on? Carry on, coach. Okay. Game day. Game day. Just some some thoughts here for you to think about. Free games. 
pre-game schedule. No, that's from here. Unmute me. We good? Look like you the size. Somebody's talking. Can you guys mute whoever you are? All right. Um, guys, a pre-game schedule and some rituals. Uh, just, you know, with your planning, I said, we were talking about practice planning yesterday, like planning a season, planning the months, planning the weeks, planning the days, plan your game days. What time are, you, are your kids going to arrive to the gym? What are they going to do first? When do you go to the locker room if you have one, you know, to talk to your group? Uh, what do you do in the warm up? Uh, do you have any leaders that can, that, that can, you know, express themselves during this time and help you to get focused? Um, what kind of activities are you going to do to the warm up? Or are you just going to do what everybody else does and shoot, you know, two hand, you know, two line layups? Um, what is, you know, what are the, the fight, what, what, I think it's very important to think about what are you going to say before the game, okay? And the reason I think it's important is because as coaches, we can become very uh, kind of self-important. And we think that we have to say so many things before the game to prepare our players, right? You, I mean, it's, it's like if you're going to go to a maths test, it's like cramming the night before. Like, it doesn't work. Like anything you tell your players before the game, if it gets past like one or two or three things maximum, they're not listening anymore. They can't take in all that information. They, they, their brain is too busy with all of the other things that's going on. So keep it very short and sharp. Focus, very focused. Okay, in the game, what are the roles and responsibilities? So if you have assistant coaches, or if you have volunteer parents or anything like that, you know, can they have a role on the bench? Uh, what, what, what is it? Are they going to talk to the players during the game that are sitting on the bench? Um, do you have any kind of rotation system that you like to do? Um, have you written that down and thought about it? Have you experimented with rotations, you know, uh, five in and five out or playing, uh, you know, depending on the rules that you have there, uh, you know, playing, kids for like six minutes and changing making sure that you change kids periodically so that they don't get too tired um and then the roles for the players that are on the bench you know what 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 are their expectations and what are your expectations of them and do they know it you know have you talked to them away from the game about what you would like to see them doing during the game and have you asked them if they have any ideas about that do you have a huddle protocol? Okay. And that means that what I mean by that is just any time that you are with the group, that's a timeout. It's the end of a period. It can be before the game, half time, and after the game. Do you have protocol for that? Um, so in terms of like uh, how do people move to the bench? If the timeout is called, are your five players that are on the court, are they going to come and sit in front of you in the timeout? And are the other guys going to come up around you like this? Um, how many things do you say in the timeout? You know, again, it's you can't say too much. Don't talk all about like six different things. Don't go from offense to defense in one timeout. You have to talk about one or two things in a timeout. OK, write that down, you know, really get focused on it because I'm, I, I believe this to be true. If you could even plan your timeouts and not worry about really what's happening in the game, okay, maybe and you know maybe until the end there might be some important things that you need to take note of. But in the first and second quarters, you might plan that your first timeout you're going to talk about offense. In your next timeout, you're going to talk about defense, regardless of what happens in the game. Because don't forget that we are talking about coaching kids and their development is. A long process. It's not necessarily just about this game. Um, and then post-game pro protocol. Uh, I'm a big believer that uh, kids aren't listening after the game. You know, if you lose a game and then you go in there and try to tell them why they lost or try to make improvements, they're not. They're not going to hear it. Um, and 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 also, if they win, you know, they don't want to hear about anything that they did wrong or any improvements that they need to make. Um, so I would suggest that you have a quick post-game protocol, which is kind of get together 
say something nice to the group, uh, get the schedule for whatever's going to happen next, and then prepare for what you're going to say, you know, after that, and, and you can review the game later. And now we'll talk about reviewing the game. So think about when you're going to talk to the players. As I just said, I wouldn't do it right after the game. Um, it can be a very sensitive time, uh, especially if you've lost. So think about maybe doing this the next day or, or whenever is the next time you practice. Take a few minutes at the beginning to make any of the points that you would like to make um, about the game then. So that means that you've got to take notes. And uh, as a coach, you have to be level-headed. Okay, as a coach, we have to be level-headed. If we lose a game and we're hot because, you know, something went wrong or the referees made bad decisions or you're angry because the players didn't do something that you expected them to do, you're going to lose focus. You're going to be too angry about what happened and you're going to be thinking about that and you're going to carry it with you back to your house, you know, with your family and it's going to affect your life. Don't let it do that, please. Be, uh, take a deep breath at the end of a game, win or lose, and take a couple of minutes to write down your initial thoughts about what happened during that game and what you might carry to the practice floor next, okay? Uh, next, uh, we all, I hopefully you guys all know this, that video is very, very useful because it doesn't lie. Uh, you know, we, everybody sees different things in, in a game. You know, the players have their own perspective. You have seen something uh, from the sideline. The assistant coach and the parents have seen maybe something else, even though we're looking at the same thing. Everybody's kind of got their own way of looking at these things. But the video, when we come, when we come to it a day or two later, everybody's a little bit calmer. And it will show us things which we did not remember or we didn't see. Okay, so I would suggest that if you do, if you can, to use video. And you don't have to watch all of it. Okay, you, you don't have to watch all of it. If you're pressed for time um, as a coach and you have too much going on, uh, A, you can only watch, you know, one quarter, for example, which is 10 minutes. That's not a lot. Or you need to assign somebody else to watch it and cut it for you so that you only see certain pieces. Um, but I would suggest that if you can, you know, film it and, and, and look at some of it. And, and another thing that I forgot to mention when I was talking about huddle protocol, another thing from Alan Keane, he films all of his timeouts and then he watches them back. And I think that's a great experiment because often we say things in the heat of the moment and we don't necessarily remember what they were and we think we're doing a good job. And then we look back and we go, oh man, I just don't think I want to say that to my kids or I should have put that in a different way. And that's a real learning for us. Um, again, if you're going to video the team playing and you're going to critique them using video, it's a very powerful thing to be doing it yourself because you will experience some of the same emotions that the players might experience when you point out their mistakes, okay? Because it hurts a lot of the time. If you're a kid and you're a player and you're watching video and the coach is telling you, look how you missed this box out, look how you didn't run back on defense, uh, that's quite hard to take. And if you're reviewing your own video, you get a little bit of experience about that. And then you might go a little bit easier on these guys and make sure you show them some good stuff as well as some stuff that you're going to critique. Um, so, yeah, I just said it just there with a little bit of the, you, you don't necessarily have to watch the whole video. Please make sure you prioritize what it is that you are looking for when you do watch the video. Okay, because especially if you're talking about under 14s or under 16, something like this, junior players, I mean, there's going to be all kinds of mistakes, you know, all the, the kids are going to make all kinds of errors. There's going to be good things and bad things in all areas of the game. Prioritize what it is that you want to focus on. So that might be spacing. You might just focus on spacing when you watch the video. Just take notes on the spacing in offense when you watch your video of your game and then focus on that in the practices or, you know, whatever, boxing out or whatever it is that you decide. But if you try to tackle all the things at once, you're not going to come out with anything. So being focused is very easy. Play the long game, okay? You, you know, if, the, if, if you want to play fast, but 
there are more important things to do right now, like learn how the fundamentals and how to share the ball and how to space the floor and how to time working together properly, then playing fast might have to wait, you know, and you focus on these things and get it done. And then at some point in the future, you can start working on that. Um, and then reviewing the games provides you an opportunity to adjust that plan that you built. You know, we talked about planning yesterday and making sure that you've got a plan for the future of what you're trying to achieve through the seasons and, and, and throughout the year. Um, now, when you watch the game, especially if you're reviewing video, you might see some stuff where, which makes you think, oh man, I have a plan to do all this stuff, but the game is telling me that I cannot do it. I got to focus on something else. And we have to strike a balance here, okay? Because if, you, if you're always like that, if you have a plan going in this direction and you really thought about it and you think, right, I want my kids to develop well defensively, for example, on these principles, but then it comes to the game and you watch the tape and your kids can't play offense, what are you going to do? You're going to change your whole plan and then go coach offense? You, you have to be careful, okay? Because if your priority really is to teach defense, then focus and prioritize on defense. And you're going to have to just accept that maybe you're not going to be very good in offense for a little while until you start focusing on it. And um, so, you know, you, you just being a coach is like putting the puzzle pieces together. It's not an exact science. Um, but one thing we all do know is that if you try to do everything, you will end up doing nothing. Um, so there you go. Um, that guys, we're going to, we're going to finish there on game preparation and game coaching from my side. Um, let's take questions on this. Yeah, coach. So two things. First coach is what about, uh, giving role players, um, based on their performance in the game, um, like game winning shots. Or like uh, when they step up, when the game is on the line, are you going to allow it based on their performance in the game? Or do you keep your rotation? Ooh. Well, okay. So you're asking me, the question is, it's the end of the game, it's a timeout, mm. and one of the players has been playing well, but usually it might be somebody else's turn to do something. For example, in a, in a particular play, is that right? No, coach. Basically, for example, uh, a sixth man or a seventh guy in your rotation suddenly plays well, maybe. Are you going to risk it? Give it, give mm -hmm. it his time to shine? Well, look, I have a very different way of looking at this than I think is normal. Um, and it may not fit everybody here at the moment. I, you make your own decisions, okay, guys? As a coach, uh, what, I, what I'm not doing now is I don't draw plays in timeouts, okay? I don't talk about uh, who's going to take what shot in timeouts. I don't do it at all. I have some very different practices in our timeouts, which are all about uh, helping my players to relax, to focus, and to access the moment, you know? Because the moment is, is right here. So if we talk about the end of the game, you know, you've heard me talk. I talk about creativity. I talk about being in the moment and being kind of fearless, fearless of making a mistake, okay? So I'm not going to tell anybody whose turn it is to shoot the ball or, or make a move or whatever it is. That will come from the people that are on the floor. And I will make, we will make the decisions together about who is on the floor at that time. And then the, the thing is going to happen. And, and just as a reminder, guys, we're not talking about the pro level, okay? I am talking about developing young kids. And for me, the most important thing is um, helping these guys have positive experiences to learn about themselves, to access the moment and be fearless so that they may make a mistake by taking a risk. Um, and if that means the 10th man happens to be on the floor and decides that it's his turn or her turn, I don't know. I mean, let's be there and see what happens. And then I'll tell you if, uh, if I have anything to say about it, but um, I'm prepared to allow that to happen uh, as, as a learning for all of us. So. <laughs> coach, uh, uh, Coach Luke. Yeah, Coach, uh, you, you, you mentioned about reviews, okay? Reviewing athletes. Yeah. Yeah. How important it is, or is it also that 
we review our coaches. Okay, you, okay, your assistant, you review your assistant coaches yeah. and your assistant also, assistant coaches also, do, yeah. do the same that they give their reviews on your actions during the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so uh, a, f- a few of the, uh, very, very important. Uh, it's the same, it's, l- it's like coaching the kids, isn't it? You know, if you're going to uh, um, critique the kids, if you're going to say, okay, you guys made mistakes here and there, and this is how you correct them, the, the best way for you to connect with the players, for you to be the kind of person that you would like th- those people to be when they're being criticized is to have experience of being criticized and giving space for not only the assistant coaches, but the players also, if they're old enough to uh, criticize anything that you're doing. Um, you know, you, 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 if anybody does have an assistant coach, hopefully you're giving them space during the game as well to say things to you, uh, you know, suggest things. And, you know, you're not going to take all of those suggestions necessarily, but, make sure they feel comfortable to say to you, hey, coach, what about this? Can we do this? Do you think we can do this? I think we should do that. Um, instead of going, just shut up and let me coach. You know, um, we, we've got to do this together. And and um, I, I think it's all about teaching and learning for everybody. So, so yeah, definitely, we've got to do that. Thank you, coach. Yeah. Um, coach Rob, there's two connected questions here. One is from coach um, Jed. The other one is from coach... Manolo. So, how do you feel about parents coaching on the sideline during the game? And the other one is, have you ever experienced coaching a team where one of the player is the son of the owner of the team? Uh, and how do you deal with it if the son of the owner doesn't play well and wants to have more time? Um, so, uh, the first question was about the parents. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not good. Uh, Look, we are going, the parents are going to go through it, okay, with me. I can only give you my experience. The parents are a part of this. If I'm coaching kids, the parents are a part of it. They're having team meetings as well as the kids um, uh, with me. And we are talking about their conduct and how they are with their kids outside of the court and also in the games. And, uh, and just like Louis mentioned there with the assistant coaches critiquing the head coach and vice versa, you know, if, if if coach if parents are getting out of line, then we need to be able to address that, and uh, we also need to be able to recruit those people in to help us because if you can get great volunteer help from parents because they're really invested, they really want to be involved, but maybe they don't know how. Um, so if you can build the relationship with the parents so that there is a bit of trust, then the more trust that you have, the more honest you can be when you have to criticize. And uh, so, you know, it's not going to work if you're just coaching your team and you never really speak to the parents and then you see them coaching their son or daughter on the sideline and then you go over there and say, hey, can't do that. It doesn't work like that. Okay, we've got to bring them in. We've got to make them feel part of the team. And just like the team, everybody gets coached in this team. And that's how I do it. Um, The second question was, sorry, remind me. The one about the owner's son. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I had this many years ago, um, uh, many years ago, we, in Iceland, uh, we were getting ready to play in the playoffs and the son of the owner was on the team and he wasn't happy with his minutes right before practice. Uh, he came to me and he was like, right, I, I, I need to play more. And he gave us pretty much an ultimatum. He said he wasn't going to practice, uh, until he could be assured that he you know, was going to play more. And what I, what I did was actually, I didn't, he didn't practice. Uh, I sort of let him do what he asked to do because he was, the own, he was the son of the owner. And I was like, right, what am I supposed to do? And um, unfortunately what happened was it, you know, it affected the whole group because everybody smelt it. Everybody felt it. You, we were just letting him do whatever he wanted. And that affected everybody's energy, and then we lost. Um, so on reflection, if I would be given another opportunity to do that, I would have taken things into my own hands, and I would have said, if you, know, if you don't practice, you will not play. And I w- I'm ready to get fired for that. 
uh, th that's, but I was very young and very weak uh, then, and uh, I'm a bit older now, and so a bit more ready for that situation. I understand, look, if it happens where you are, it's very hard, but the only way forwards here is building relationships um, and, uh, and being honest with yourself. Uh, you know, you have, to, you have to make a decision on what you're prepared to, to accept and what you're not prepared to accept. And sometimes that means kind of putting your own job at risk uh, if, you're, if you're not happy with the way things are going. And you have to make a stand. Hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. coach. Coach, what about um, dealing with officials during the game? Yeah, um, officials. Uh, I love all of them. Uh, <laughs> obviously, uh, there are times when I don't agree with them, um, but there are times when I don't agree with my assistant coaches, and there are times when my players don't agree with me. And same that goes with the parents. But the officials are. A part of our game just like winning and losing is just like uh, everything is they are not any more important than anything else and they are not more they are not less important than anything else we need officials to be in the game and as bad as they might be you know uh, they're probably not very well paid at most levels of the game and but they are trying their best and they they you see the thing here is when we coach kids right this is what I, I would challenge everybody to think about. If you have 12 kids on your team, how many of those kids, if they're 12 years old, 10 years from now are going to be professional basketball players? If it's one, you've done very, very well. Okay, so if you have 12, 12 year olds in 10 years time, if one of those guys is a pro basketball player earning a good salary, you've done well. Okay, 11 of those guys are not going to be pro basketball players. Maybe a couple of them are going to be coaches. Maybe one of them is going to be a referee. Maybe one of them is going to be a table official. Maybe one of them is just going to be a parent of a kid that plays basketball. You know, some of them are just going to go off and not be involved in the game. Um, people want to be involved in the game. And some of people like us, we couldn't make it as players. So we're coaches. Other players, they're going to be referees. I think what we need to do as coaches is appreciate the referees, you know, for what they are. They're a part of our game. And what they do is not ever to hurt us personally. I don't think so. I mean, you know, there's obviously examples of this, but in general, the referees are just trying to do the best job that they can. And if you're going to focus any of your energy as a coach on the calls of the referees, you are making an example to your kids that it's okay to criticize the referee, which it's not. And if you ever have to do that, if you ever have to approach the referee uh, to discuss anything or ask about calls, do it in the right way within the rules of the game so that you will be the, uh, the role model for any of your kids. Because at one day, one of your kids is going to yell at the referee and then you're going to say, hey, don't do that. But if you're doing it, you don't have a leg to stand on. Yeah. And yeah. Yep. Yes, coach. And it's important also coaches should know that during games, it's, there are only two correctable error, uh, correctable uh, calls. calls. Right. Yeah. If it's a foul, you cannot correct that. It's a foul. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let it go, man. <laughs> you know, so the, 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 the seren, the ser what is it? The, uh, the prayer of serendipity to, uh, to accept what, what is it now? What, to accept what cannot be yeah. Yeah, corrected, uh, cannot be changed, and to... Uh, I forgot the... To let the, go the, of the things that... To accept the things that you cannot change. Yep. To change the things that you can, and the wisdom to know the difference. The difference, yeah. You cannot change a referee. So, that's it. Yeah, thanks, Coach. That's actually my my personal question and another personal question of mine is about fighting fighting in a game what about it um have you ever experienced it or how would you prevent <laughs> it or how just personal sharing well we could do another call on stories I got, <laughs> uh, i've seen it yeah i've been a part of it um uh, it's 
frightening when it's really happening. Uh, and I've seen it many, many times. Um, I mean, it, we just try to uh, resolve it quickly as a player or a coach. If you're involved in it, you've got to try to stop it, first of all, because you don't want anybody to get seriously hurt. Uh, it's a loss of control at the end of the day. People are losing control of their emotions. They don't know how to deal with them. And uh, they, they lack out. And so the first thing we've got to try to do is help everybody be safe. And then you just do what you can with the people in your circle. You know, if one of your players started a fight or got involved in a fight, then first of all, make sure they're safe. And then later, when they've cooled down and had some time to reflect, uh, if it's appropriate for you to talk to them, then talk to them and see if you can see if they need anybody just to talk to, first of all. And you don't even necessarily need to help them, but maybe they do need some help. Um, and, and if you can be that person to help them or point them in the right direction, then, then that's great. But I don't think we can do much more than that. Any more questions, coaches? Oh, we have some comments here, coach, from Coach Mao. Keep the level of respect to all officials and you'll get that respect tenfold. Get it, you'll get it back. Uh, another yeah, from I, Coach I will, I just, I just uh, you know, I will expand that comment. That comment is true. Um, that, what that says to me is something I've heard a lot recently. It's if you give, okay, if you give out to the world, you will receive back in tenfold, okay? So instead of holding on to you know your drills and your plays and your players and you know your uh, just everything is yours and you just over here coaching your team give respect give love give your knowledge share it with the world you know and uh, and the more you give away weirdly somehow air, things come back to you in 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 many beautiful ways and so you know, give respect to the officials, give respect to the parents um, and, and everybody that's involved. And yes, it will turn around and come to you at some point uh, in the future. Um, Coach, uh, Coach Jun asked, in your personal opinion, what do you think are the qualities of being a champion? What, like what separates maybe a, a normal team from a champion team? Okay, I'm thinking. Well, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, we all know this. I mean, they, they are, first of all, they are the physical attributes of this team. They're going to have great athletes. They're going to have very skilled players. They're going to have players that do very special things. Uh, champions are going to have players that are just outstanding in, in one or two particular areas. Um, and then they are going to work very, very well together, uh, especially when things are hard. I think that's a good trait of a champion is when things get difficult, that's when they're at their best. Because on the road to a championship, it's not going to be all uh, roses and, uh, and, and beautiful things. It's going to be you know, down by 10 with four minutes left. In a, in a playoff game and it's going to be uh, tied at halftime against a very difficult team on the road and your best player has got four fouls you know it's got that they're going to you, your champion is champion team is going to have guys that step up when they're not necessarily supposed to um, and all these kind of things and so it goes so like things like grit and, uh, and determination and an unwillingness to give up uh, I think uh, determine you know, championship level teams. Um, coach, uh, Coach Jed, uh, I think I saw your video. It's on. Coach, you can ask this personally to Coach Rob. Coach Jed, yeah, I can see your video. You're on. Uh, you coach Rob. Yes, sir. Coach Rob, uh, I just want to ask a question about have you experienced uh, playing against a, another team who dis who disrespect the, the game of basketball and how do you deal that because yeah. these are very important issues right now yeah yeah um 
yeah, I have experienced it um, in, in a few different ways. And, uh, you know, the only way forward, I think, is to be the change that you want to see in the world. You know, if you can't fight fire with fire, if you, if you want to retaliate against people disrespecting the game, then you are bringing the same energy that they brought. And, you know, it's, it's like, uh, it's a little bit like when people don't like a political situation in a country and then they turn to violence and, you know, hurting people and, and property, that kind of energy is not really going to change anything. We, we need to find a different way. And so when people are disrespecting us and the game that we love, um, we need to change the, the vibe and the vibe of, of appreciation, the vibe of love, the vibe of respect. Uh, we need to give that out. And, um, you know, and I just think that uh, people that do disrespect the game, something went, went sort of wrong for them at some point uh, in their lives, which has made them act in the way that they're acting. And, uh, and I kind of feel sorry for them for that reason, you know, that, that it's, it's, people are, they have difficult experiences sometimes, and then it pushes them in a direction which they sort of lash out and, uh, you know, do something which we all look at as negative, And then we condemn them and say that they're terrible people. And then they just, they, they keep doing the same things. So uh, we've got to change the, the, the energy. And, um, and show that respect and show that love for all people and and uh, and it will win out for sure thanks coach yeah respect the game thank you coach rob for your yeah. great experience sharing your ideas yeah all right so let's do this to finish guys it's been a wonderful four sessions uh please follow um on the facebook page we have there, I think most of you are on there. We're going to post all of this stuff. There's going to be much more coming. I've got a few podcast episodes out uh, so far uh, with a couple of different people and we'll be creating our own as well. Um, and then the website is up. Uh, it's, it's kind of beta right now. I'm, I'm trying to build something which is a resource for players and coaches and, uh, and it's, it's, it's going. So I would appreciate you guys to go there to read uh, to watch the videos that we have and, um, and, you know, and get in touch if you, if you want or need anything. And then, you know, we'll continue to try to provide uh, services and help for you guys that will help you to uh, achieve your goals as coaches. And, um, you know, let's continue the conversation. Let's keep helping each other. And uh, I, I want to say a huge thank you to all of you for attending. Uh, all of these sessions and, uh, and participating the way that you have. Uh, and lastly, say a big thanks to Calvin and uh, Louis for, you know, helping me here and, and the great work that you're doing with the community um, in, in the Philippines. Yeah. Coach, I want to share my screen also. Okay. Yeah. Great, Coach. So for those who are joining, you don't forget to to follow Kairos Performance on Instagram and Facebook. You can add also Coach Rob. And also, Coach, on our end, um, <laughs> this is something from us, Coach. So from the Coach Lou. Just can read, Coach. This yeah. is our first certificate, Coach, issued for 2021. No way. Yeah. Thank you so much. And our gratitude uh, over, okay, on this uh, mini series, Coach Rob. I so just want, uh, I will just read it. Okay, Basketball Coaches Association of the Philippines certificate of appreciation is cert case awarded to Coach Rob Newsom, okay, Kairos performance, and in recognition of your important contribution to the continuous learning and development of basketball coaches in the Philippines through an online lecture series held from April 16 to 19, 2021. Given this 19th day of April 2021, signed Calvin Kyle M. Sangalang, Secretary General, and yours truly, President Luis Jose M. Gonzalez III. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Coach. You know. oh, I, am, I am humbled and grateful for this. It's a wonderful gesture from you guys. And 
thank you so much for for uh, doing it with me. Uh, it's been awesome. So let's keep let's keep going. Let's keep uh, uh, working to you know uh, give what we can to the community. Thank you very much, Coach. And with that, again, um, don't forget Kairos Performance and Coach Rob Newson. We will have more projects with Coach Rob, and I hope Coach Rob will always be there for us. Um, uh, for those who are on the mailing list, um, uh, I will create a, a separate uh, transaction for this one. I screenshot all your names, but you can contact me or Coach Louis directly to give your email address so we can forward you all the details. And please, yeah, we'll, um, we'll put the yes, Calvin, we're going to put all the materials together in one mm -hmm. PDF, okay? So all of the decks and then the extra materials will go in one PDF that will be ready tomorrow. So you can send that out uh, to, to everybody. Yes, coach. Thank you. And coach, just in case, uh, can they, can they share it? To, uh, no? to turn on their cameras. Okay, yeah, coach. For, for their, we like for a class picture here. Are you, no? <laughs> coach, may you name? Coach, can we? Yes, coach. All right. I'm going to take a video. Okay. Wait lang, coaches. Ha? Don't turn off because I need to screenshot three pages. Okay, smile. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, close the chat. Okay, smile. Wait. Yeah, everyone's here. Nice. <laughs> One more. Beautiful. Wait. Sorry, wait. Just wait. Uh, please don't put anything on the chat. It pops up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um. Uh, uh, finally, uh, final words. Um. Coach Rob. About pandemic, hanging on, and all this, coach. Just some hey, something from yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, look, guys, it's difficult. Uh, we're, we're, but we're in this together, and uh, you know there are so many people here that you know you can reach out just for a phone call if you need to. Um, be grateful for the things that you do have. Uh, you know, whether it's a roof over your head or a family to be around, or uh, a call to get on for Zoom with some coaches. Uh, and food on your plate, you know, let, let's be grateful for the things that we do have and, um, and support each other when we are having a difficult time. Um, and we will come out the other side uh, and, uh, and, and, and we will see each other on the floor at some point. Let's hope it's in 2021, but if whenever it is, we will do it. Thank you, coaches. Thank okay, you guys. Coach Lou. Yes, Louis. Yeah, this is uh, uh, Coach Rob. Okay, thank you, thank you very much okay, for really for your time and effort of doing this, uh, uh, coaches. Okay, uh, yeah, just be, let's just everybody continue to be a student of the game, uh, yeah. take advantage okay, of the reset. Okay, to improve. Okay, to get better. Yep. Okay, everyone, keep in touch. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Bye, night. Guys. Thank Bye. you, Coach Rob. Thank you, Coach Louis. Thank you, Calvin. We miss Thank you. Tom. Thanks, Coach Rob. Thanks, Coach Calvin. Thanks, Thank Coach Louis. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Coach Rob. Thank you. Hey, uh, who do I, do I see somebody down there in Vietnam? <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, no. I see someone here. <laughs> What's up, Coach Dre? <laughs> this is your boy, Ray? <laughs> yeah, he's from uh, Vietnam also. <laughs> Where are you? I'm actually in Thailand right now, but no, I played in, in the, the, over there, and uh, I was looking forward to to listening to you guys i just got out of a meeting of my own so all right i've You're been i've back? been in yeah of course i'm coming back i've been doing skills training here for the u20 guys and and you know a lot of youth out here so i was looking forward just to hearing what the coaches were um just just be a student of the game you know just try to keep learning because you know i'm coming towards the end of my career and uh i love coaching i love i love skill development
Awesome, man. All right. Well, make sure you connect to me on Facebook, man. We can we can talk, and then if you once you get here, we can meet. Most definitely, most definitely. I've heard a lot of good things about you. I've been kind of connected to some people that you you know already, yeah. so it's it's cool. I'll definitely get in touch with you. All right. Good stuff. Appreciate you. All right, man. See you. Coach Dre, man, you're the man. Bye, guys. Good night, Coach Dre. Good night, Goodbye, Coach guys. Rob. All right, I'm leaving now. Good night, everyone. Good night, Coach Bye-bye.